Welcome, everybody, to episode 13, unlucky 13. 13 of Sad Songs Quarantine Hour. Uh, we are your hosts, the Milk Carton Kids. And I I'm bet you the number 13 is actually lucky, just everybody wore it out, and now they skip it. Yeah. I've never liked when hotels or office buildings skip 13 on the elevator. Like if there's yeah. anything intrinsically unlucky about the 13th floor, it would just apply to the 14th. Yeah. Seems like it just causes trouble. Our guest this week is a veritable movie star, John C. Riley. Yeah. He's been in so many movies. You forget how many movies he's been in. Dozens. What's eating Gilbert Grape? Remember? Joey loves stars. <laughs> no. Gets right, gets right up close to him. Loves it. Nothing like being close to a star. Mm -hmm. No, but mostly I love John C. Riley. He, yeah, he's great. He's one of the most charismatic performers I've ever been on stage with. He's one of the kindest people we've ever hung around with backstage. And we've shared a lot of stages with, with him. He's, I think, the most consistent guest on Sad Songs Comedy Hour when we've done it in real life at Largo. He comes down. And now here he is, stuck in our phone. <laughs> uh, there this week's episode is benefiting NEVA, once again, National Independent Venue Association. We are still trying to save our stages. Uh, please support Got to use that hashtag. Use that hashtag or else they won't get saved. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing like a hashtag to affect uh, mass. That's our new savior, the hashtag. Hashtag. That's how it works. Well, I hope this one works because um, I'm getting sick of talking to you on Zoom, Kenneth, and I would like to see you in real life. Yeah, right, hop in the car, drive to Nashville. Too far. Yeah. Well, enjoy John C. Riley. All right, here he comes. Well, hello. It's just as we expected to find you. Yes. <laughs> Hi, guys. How are hey, John. you? John. Oh. Yeah. John, you and me are like, we're living the same life. I was just eating watermelon myself. There's some sweet ones out there. Do you guys have the same watermelon dealer? <laughs> we all have the same watermelon dealer, Kenneth. Whole Foods. <laughs> uh, Jeff Bezos. Mother oh, Earth. Some people call it whole paycheck. I call it hell foods. Now that you have to go with a sweaty mask on and wonder if this trip is going to be the one that costs you. Uh, it costs hard. you all the watermelon. Hardly even worth it until you get home and, and taste how sweet that melon is. <laughs> it is. It's a real crapshoot. I bought it out of season before and you're like, ah. Then you've got like five pounds to throw away. But when it's sweet, I'm Yeah, that's a high that. risk fruit. Yeah, how do you know? It's a high risk fruit. You get a bad apple, it's just a, a drop in the bucket, as it were. A watermelon, that takes up space. Yeah, uh, the only real way to tell if a watermelon is ripe is to buy it at the right time of year. That's my yeah. experience. That's right. Next week, we're doing peaches. <laughs> I had peaches this morning. They're, they are just starting to come around uh, tasting good. Oh, yeah. But you got to watch out for that pit, whereas the watermelon has no pit. Well, I have seeds. If my mother used to tell me would grow watermelons in my stomach if I swallowed them, but I didn't. She lied to you. <laughs> but peaches are coming in strong. Oh, and cherries. Look out. Don't sleep on cherries. They're about to blow oh, yeah. your mouth. We got our first bag of cherries this week, and it was worth it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, I do have a number of fruit trees. I have a kumquat. I've got an orange tree, a lemon tree, plum tree, an apricot tree. Um, I mean, there's just individual trees. And the problem with having a tree, like a really fruitful tree, is like all of a sudden you've got <laughs> – 2,000 apricots to deal with, and the rats and the uh, squirrels are overjoyed, but you're just trying to pick as fast as you can. 
But, but you'll yeah. never get scurvy. No, I'll never get scurvy. I'm having a hell of a time keeping the rabbits out of my strawberries. You've seen Bugs Bunny. You know, they're smart. I'd say let the rabbits have the strawberries. That's a winning combination. I want the strawberries. I'm sure there's enough to share, but the strawberries are probably the perfect size for those cute little paws. And they eat them. They probably look adorable. Their ears flop around. This is a, you're depriving the world of a very, very nice sight. I want my children to have the strawberries. I, that's one of the reasons we stopped gardening in earnest here, a vegetable garden, because those ground squirrels were just impossible to thwart. Yeah. They dig under and come out, you know, it's just, there's just no way unless you build this kind of joyless penitentiary of a garden box, you know, it's like <laughs> our family's uh, summer house is, is in the, the asparagus capital of the world. Oh. Oceana County, Michigan, and actually there's this, if you want to talk about farming, we can. I'm about to tell you a farming story. So there's this guy, so most of the people out there either grow corn, asparagus, or cherries. Something like 75% of the world's maraschino cherries come from that same county. No way. The big cherry processor there. But the asparagus was like a specialty for that county and because Western Michigan is almost entirely sand. It's about six inches of dirt and then sand, um, which is causing huge erosion problems right now. But um, so asparagus grows very well in sand. It needs a lot of drainage, etc. And very few people in the world knew how to grow it as well as people in this county. Well, someone in Chile approached one of the farmers and said, "Would you come? We'll give you uh, forty thousand dollars. I don't know what the figure was. Some." Okay, amount of money, but nothing that's going to like set you up for life. Um, would you come to Chile and teach us how to grow asparagus? Because we have sandy soil here, but no one really knows how to grow it very well. He said, oh, sure. So he flew down to Chile, he taught them how to grow asparagus, and within six months, Chile was a direct competitor <laughs> for asparagus. <laughs> and now this poor guy, he's like a pariah in the community. Right. All the other Asparagus guys are like, yeah, thanks, Joe. But um, of course, his name was Joe. I knew it. That's what I was thinking. I just said that just to. I bet you're right. Common name. I bet the cherry farms are also downwind from the asparagus farms. If not, they should move them around that way. Why? Well, just all the because after you eat so much asparagus, your piss starts to smell. Really? That's where this is devolving into. You know, I wanted to mention, not, I didn't say Joe because I was trying to make fun of Joe. I said Joe just because it's like, when I was a kid, we could make believe that's, okay, Joe, all right, meet you over here, Joe. Like, everyone was Joe. Okay. Yeah. Look at our names, Joseph, John, Kenneth. Nobody has those names anymore. Now it's like Akko, and Sanaya, and <laughs> Hugo. It's like a competition among parents to outcool each other with names. Like, we we have my kids have very traditional names. They're named after their grandfather and great grandfather, Jack and Ed. You go, Ed. <laughs> That's so, <laughs> so fun to call a little kid Ed. Listen, Ed, pick up your shoes. <laughs> you know how weird it was the first couple times to talk about changing Ed's diaper. <laughs> it sounds like you're in a nursing home. Yeah. Uh, who's gonna change Ed's diaper? <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so Tom and I, I actually don't remember when Tom and I met offhand. I'm not a very linear timeline kind of person, but yeah. I saw him playing with uh, Angie Korea at Tangier. They were called Les Shelleys. Mm -hmm. and I had been looking for a partner to sing close harmony with. And so I went to that show at Tangier to see the Living Sisters and then saw Tom open for them and literally my jaw hit the table and I just sat there the whole time. I could not believe the sound that his voice was making. I was like, that's him. That's the guy. That's the guy I'm gonna sing close harmony with. Oh my God, I found him and I talked him up afterwards and he was like, holy shit, it's a movie star. Why are you talking to me? Like, it was just kind of surreal for him. But anyway, so we start this band together. He, I, Becky Stark, 
Dan Byrne, I think Willie Watson was with us for a while, Sebastian Steinberg, John Riley and friends, and we start doing it at Largo. And we're struggling to kind of get people to accept that this actor can sing or whatever, we're just trying to you know, get people to accept me musically and get people to show up at the shows. And, you know, they don't do a lot of promotion at Largo, so you have to have your own kind of you know, social media or whatever, which I had none of, and I still don't. Um, but I, I was really, I really believed in this idea, like there's something out there, people really want to hear this close harmony stuff. Like the Everly's did it, pure, around one microphone, like beautifully meshed voices, mixing themselves. And then about, I don't know, six months into that project, Lanny's like, I've heard of these guys, the Milk Carton Kids. I'm like, <laughs> who? The Milk Carton Kids. They're from Silver Lake, apparently. They're selling out. They're doing close harmony. They're real great. Oh, you should come see them. Maybe you could play with them. And I was like, no, no, no. I was like, <laughs> those guys. Dare them. Start doing close harmony stuff. Right when I'm trying to get this thing going, oh, sure. Now the middle card and kid bullshit, bullshit. I literally, I'll tell you when the moment was when I finally realized what an idiot I was being. Because I didn't see you guys. I didn't have your records, and I just kept hearing about it. And all I was just was just consumed with this jealousy of like, Ugh, to make it look so goddamn easy, just selling out Largo multiple nights. Oh, from Silver Lake. I've lived in Silver Lake for 11 years. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really like, fuck those guys. I didn't even know what your faces looked like. I just knew that name and these two fucking guys are playing this music. Fine, whatever, whatever. And we trudged on and we went. We did shows in Australia and England and Ireland, all over the world. You know, wherever I traveled for movies, I would bring the band and do shows. And then we finally get invited to the Newport Folk Festival. And people that I really trusted along the way kept saying, like, those milk carton kids are pretty fucking good. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. I'm not get And then finally, like, one more person said it while we are at Newport, like, you really should check out those milk carton guys. They're pretty good, you know? And I was like, fine. I'll go stand by the side of the stage. And I make my way over after our concert, which was a big hit, walk over to your stage, and you're like twice the size, packed full of people, the two of you up there with your little handkerchief tied in your guitar in front of the one mic, and I stand literally like this. <laughs> with my arms folded. And after about 10 seconds, I just went, uh, I should stop doing it. I should just stop doing this. These guys actually are like a reincarnation, practically, of fucking Phil and Don. You guys were actually you're better guitar players than Phil and Don. It was well, like one of us you're improving on the Everly Brothers. Okay, well, forget it. You know, like, and then I really then you'll notice. Did you notice at the at that Newport Folk Festival? I sort of make my way over to you, like, hey, I'm John. <laughs> Oh, you saw you at the side of the stage in between every song. It's all we could talk about. John Riley's watching us. I started to uh, really put on the charm offensive after that. And I was like, I have to just, <laughs> I have to correct this idiotic thinking that I had. And it was a good lesson, actually, just not to think that way. I couldn't hear yeah. you, but you just said, you cut out a little bit. Oh, I said, um, Kenneth, did you hear me? I did. Are you lonesome tonight? Do you miss me tonight? Are you sorry we drifted apart? Does your memory stray to a bright sunny day when I kissed you and called you sweetheart? Do the chairs in your parlor seem empty and bare? Do you gaze at your doorstep and picture me there? Is your heart filled with pain? Shall I come back again? Tell me, dear. Are you lonesome 
Tschüss.